Now we'll go ahead with the uh, rest of the indications here. Um, so the patient needs to have been diagnosed um, with obstructive sleep apnea and have an AHI of between 15 and 65, and um, no more than 25% of the apneic events can be central in origin, so uh, at least 75% need to be obstructive apneas. And they need to have uh, tried CPAP and failed it for really whatever reason, including just a refusal to continue to use CPAP. Um, they need to have a BMI of 32 or less, so um, uh, morbidly obese people are not candidates. And um, they need to undergo a sleep endoscopy, which um, evaluates the pattern of collapse of the upper airway. So we're looking for um, what's called anterior posterior collapse, where the palate and tongue base um, collapse posteriorly, causing the obstruction. And about 20% of people will have what's called concentric circular collapse, where the side walls and the retropodal airway are collapsing medially, contributing to the obstruction. And if you see that pattern, uh, then they are not considered to be good candidates for the implant. Uh, so these two slides uh, demonstrate the um, the two kinds, and so here we have the AP collapse where the soft palate is falling straight back onto the um, posterior pharyngeal wall, and here we have the concentric collapse where you're getting this redundant mucosal soft tissue in the nasal pharynx and oral pharynx collapsing medially, giving you this uh, concentric collapse. So the device has the three components. Um, there's the um, a yep. uh, stimulating lead here, which gets implanted on the terminal branches of the hypoglossal nerve. Uh, the stimulator itself, which um, is about the same size and shape as a cardiac pacemaker, so we tend to try to implant it on the right side of the chest wall whenever possible. And then uh, sensing lead, which um, ideally goes between um, either fifth and sixth or sixth and seventh ribs, uh, between the external and internal intercostal muscles, and uh, so the sensing lead then tells the device each time the patient is um, taking a inspiration. So the, in my hands, um, I've implanted everybody in an outpatient setting. The surgery tends to take about three hours, so it's a fairly lengthy procedure, but is well tolerated. Generally recommend avoidance of any strenuous activity for about a week postoperatively, but Patients are up and around the next day and uh, taking a general diet uh, immediately after surgery. Uh, so the crux of the operation is the identification of um, these distal branches here, which um, supply the intrinsic muscles of the tongue, the genioglossus muscle, and the geniohyoid muscle, which are all um, muscles that cause protrusion of the tongue or anterior motion of the tongue base, thus opening the airway and the meticulous avoidance of inclusion of these branches which go to the hyoglossus and styloglossus muscle which um, will cause tongue retraction. Now, oddly enough, if you stimulate those um, uh, muscles, they do cause some stabilization of the lateral pharyngeal wall, but that's really, the benefit of that is really overridden by the tongue retraction and narrowing of the airway. Um, so this is just a, a view here of the um, uh, distal hypoglossal nerve uh, that you would see intraoperatively. So this is an old slide of mine from a year ago uh, when I gave a talk like this. And um, um, because of the coronavirus and the loss of speakers here, Doug asked me to throw together a little talk here. So uh, the F we're sleeping a scale is a questionnaire for um, getting subjective information from the patient concerning uh, their feeling of sleepiness. And so I had eight patients at that time that we had collected, and um, we had seen about a 69% reduction in the severity of sleepiness on the upward sleepiness scale. And the uh, FOSQ-10 basically is just another uh, tool for achieving the same purpose and similar findings there. Um, so at this point in time, um, I've been planted 65 patients, and we had um, some feedback from 62 patients who had been using the device for at least a month or so. Um, and we had a 92% satisfaction rate, which um, is really quite high if you have any um, experience, with, experience with doing sleep apnea surgery. Um, 
you know, it's uh, very <clears throat> gratifying to get that kind of a success rate or satisfaction rate um, rather than, or if you compare that to the outcomes from palate surgery or tongue-based surgery. Uh, there are some failures, of course, but um, overall seems to be working well. Um, <clears throat> so the apnea hypopnea index is really the gold standard, the test that we look at to see what kind of uh, outcomes we're getting. So I have uh, 32 patients who have had post-operative sleep studies that have been using the device for uh, at least six months. And um, uh, so if you, uh, on aggregate, uh, we were seeing about a 69% reduction in the AH scores in all of those patients. 31% uh, had an AHI of less than five, which we would be considered basically a cure. We had 62% um, AHI less than 10, which is pretty mild apnea that may or may not require any further therapy. And traditionally, uh, this last metric of uh, AHI less than 20 and greater, greater than 50% reduction in the preoperative AHI has been um, used to determine therapy success. And so the, we had 84% of patients um, reach that benchmark. Uh, five patients or 17% failed, um, and so they didn't, uh, didn't reach that, uh, that metric. Um, this has turned out kind of goofy here, so I'm not sure what, um, okay. So there has been uh, some reporting that um, uh, female patients have seen a little higher success rate than the male patients, and um, that does seem to be borne out um, in this, um, in my experience. Uh, it's not a huge difference, but a slight, um, slight improvement for the female population. Uh, and these are the five patients who experienced uh, treatment failure. And um, so we just kind of run through these. This um, was, a, I think, about a 75-year-old woman who had um, uh, such severe sleep apnea that she would no longer drive. And so her husband um, had to be enlisted to take her um, pretty much anywhere she wanted to go. And her preoperative AHI was 18, but during REM sleep, her um, preoperative AHI was uh, in the low 50s. Um, Postoperatively, she had a limited reduction in her overall AHI, but her um, REM AHI went to zero for some reason. I still don't have a good explanation for that, but uh, <clears throat> overall, she was very thrilled with the outcome. She was able to start driving, really got rid of her daytime sleepiness. Um, so even though she failed that metric, um, Still very happy with her, her outcome. Um, this patient didn't quite make it because he was at 21 instead of 20. Uh, this guy was a, a true failure, <laughs> as was this one. And then this last one, also an interesting case. He had a preoperative AHI of 80, which came down to 35, which is still pretty significant. So the device was working for him, but not getting him to the point where, where he would really be considered adequately treated. Um, complications, uh, I had one patient who had a hematoma at his um, incision site, and this was um, actually a very interesting case. This was a 21-year-old kid with um, Neiman Pick disease, and he had um, seizure disorder also, and had a fairly significant seizure event about three days post-op and developed the hematoma at that time. Um, the folks from Inspire were very, um, very adamant that this um, patient needed to go back to the OR, have the site explored, get the hematoma evacuated, and his family had actually brought him up from Southern Oregon to have the surgery done, and so he was back home by then, and um, I talked to his local ENT doctor and um, told him what the recommendation from the experts was, and he said, you know, this, uh, this doesn't look that bad, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it, <laughs> and so he didn't, and um, went away, uh, hematoma resolved, so he did fine without surgery. Um, probably the most common thing that you may run into with this surgery is postoperative neuropraxia because you are uh, dissecting out the, um, the terminal branches and so there is some unavoidable trauma or stretching there. Uh, it's generally pretty mild. I did have one patient um, who had some uh, complaints of dysarthria or speaking uh, difficulty for a period of about two to four weeks post-op that went away, uh, but then uh, when we actually brought him back into the office to activate the device and have him start using 
uh, his implant, uh, he had um, basically zero response to it. So the nerve was just not responding to the implant at all. And so told him to wait another month, and he came back, and same thing, still, still no response whatsoever. But his um, symptoms of neuropraxia had resolved completely. Uh, and he was uh, you know, getting quite anxious, of course, and was wanting to go back in and get the other side implanted because he you know, was really, really enthusiastic about getting treated. Uh, but I managed to string him along for almost six months. And uh, at that point, um, it's just started working again. And um, so he's actually done really well. Um, he, um, I think, got his uh, AHI down below 10, started out in the mid-30s. And so uh, for him, it just took a long time for that, that nerve to recover. Um, I had one case of the stimulation lead uh, being exposed about two months post-op. And um, have I lost Lee again? <laughs> um, so um, I do have a, a nice photo that this man sent in to me. Oh, hey, Lee, could you put the picture up now? Um, <clears throat> so this guy's a, a long-haul truck driver, and um, he called the office from um, somewhere in Nevada and said, um, said, you know, I got this thing sticking out of my neck now, and I'm not sure if that's OK. And uh, um, no, that's not the right picture. <laughs> so one other picture. The other picture? The other picture, uh, the one that you loaded up for me. So this is um, this is what the picture that he sent me, and um, I said, yeah, that's definitely not okay. And uh, said, I don't want you to try shaving until until I see you. And um, so a couple days later, he made it back to Seattle, came in the office, and. Um, I tried revising this in the office, um, fixed it, and it stayed covered for about two weeks and then popped out again. So took him to the operating room and um, you know, just buried it deeper. And this, um, this lead, uh, it's not a stiff wire, but it does have um, some built-in uh, U-turns in it to um, you know, give it some stretchiness to be in the neck. And um, so it does have a little tension, and it uh, kind of had just pushed its way through the, through the skin there. Um, so he's been, had that fixed about uh, six months ago and it's done fine with it, hasn't had any more problems. Um, I was really amazed that this worked because I thought it was going to be infected and, and just be a disaster, but um, uh, he's done fine. Um, so Lee, can you go back to the slide deck now? Um, and then I have one patient that I'm still dealing with now that um, did well for about two months, and then he started complaining of pain at the um, uh, sense lead site, so in the right chest wall. Um, and initially, uh, he said it only hurt when he turned the device on when he was using it, and so there was some concern that there could be some current leak or you know damage to the lead that happened at implant. Um, but there's some diagnostics that uh, the Inspire folks can run on the device, and so. Um, they said, no, there's no current leak, and it's functioning fine, and so this guy is just a real mystery. Um, <clears throat> so I may end up needing to pull, pull his out and reposition it, put it in a different spot, but um, trying to sit on him for a while just to see, see what happens there. Um, so um, let me, um, if you can, god damn, where did he leave again? <laughs> oh, there. So now if you can, um, run uh, the videos. Um, so what I typically do, uh, these patients start using their device about one month post-op, and I have them come back about two to three months post-op, and we do um, an awake endoscopy to evaluate the airway with the use. And um, so go ahead and run that. So this is uh, turn, turn the device on. You're looking at the palate, and uh, you can see the tongue base a little bit. and. And you activate it again here. And so you can see there's some um, pretty dramatic uh, <clears throat> anterior palate motion and airway enlargement um, in this patient. Um, so I advance the scope down and get a little better look at the base of tongue area. And uh, so I do it again. And so it, um, you know, it, it actually you know does produce a significant enlargement and stabilization of the airway. Is that a one-sided there? Yeah, yeah. It's um, 
For some reason, some people will get uh, bilateral tongue motion just with uh, single-sided stimulation. Um, probably only happens to about 30% of people, but um, uh, the device itself, incredibly dependable. Uh, just um, for some patients, it's not able to override that um, severe airway obstruction, but um, um, seems to work pretty well in, in pretty much everybody. Um, I try to have the same anesthesiologist, but it doesn't it doesn't work. So uh, I usually just have to talk with the anesthesiologist beforehand. Okay. Most of them, um, you know, we have a small group that come to our surgery center, so most of them have had some experience with it over the past few years. But um, but it does vary from person to person. Um, my wife, Terry, actually is the anesthesiologist that I, that I work with mainly, and so she's got um, got her technique down down pretty slick. So it, um, the dice or the drug-induced sleep endoscopy typically takes about um, 10 to 12 minutes, so it's it's pretty quick. And you don't move them on the OR table, you just keep them on the surgery? Um, we just bring them in the OR and, and do it on the table, because I mean, most people walk in and either walk out or go out on a, on a, in a wheelchair. No, flat. flat. Yeah, just, just straight supine. Right. Yeah, and the other, you want to try to keep their mouth closed when you're doing it, because that, that affects your findings also. Um, and then this, I just do awake sitting in the office. Um, hey, Lee, can you run that second video? Um, so this is just, that's the first one. So if you, we looked at this one, so if you can run the other. This is, um, it's kind of more of the same, a little different, um, different airway. He's got a much narrow retropalatal airway at rest, so you see a little more dramatic opening there with the uh, activation, and then the retroglossal airway. You know, again, is uh, pretty dramatically opened. So these are, you know, two people with pretty pretty good results. Not everybody will have quite that dramatic a finding. Um, so then uh, we'll go back to the slide deck. And this is really the, the last slide. But um, typically, you know, what I'll tell people is that they, they have about a 60% chance of getting, getting their apnea index down to a level where they don't require anything else for treatment. Uh, they have about an 80% chance of achieving what would be considered surgical success, um, although some people will still be fairly symptomatic with an AHI of 20. Uh, women have a slightly higher success rate. Um, and also, it's becoming apparent that uh, older people have a little higher success rate also. So the Medicare population actually does a little better than everybody else. Um, and then obviously, patients with more severe apnea are going to be a little harder to, to achieve a good result then. Although you do see pretty large drops in these people, but um, it's harder to get them, you know, down to a really low AHI. So. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the indications on the slide is AHI 15 down to 65. Is that correct? Uh -huh. That's wrong. And then on your on the failure slide, you have that with someone with an AHI of 20 and yeah. so on. I mean, how hard and fast is that 15 to 65? Is that like a good number? Or is that like a good number? Is that like how what? Like, so the indications are. Yeah. So that guy was a well, he was out of oops out of the indication level, but. Um, his insurance company still approved him, and so we still still implanted him. Um, it's not, um, I wouldn't say that, that there's um, anything wrong with doing somebody with an AHI above 65, but um, when the Inspire company set up the parameters for their study, uh, that was the limit that they set. Yeah, Pete? What, what percentage of your 62 um, patients um, previously failed you? Um, yeah, there's. I would say probably 25 to 30 percent of people have had prior surgery, either UVPP, tongue-based surgery, or even um, maxillofacial advancement surgery. Yep. So, how long have these been out? Because I've implanted a lot of vagus nerve stimulators, and it, it took a few years before the technical things started showing. Broken leaves mm -hmm. and things like that. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they've been implanting these how long? A few years? Yeah, so these, uh, this uh, device got FDA approval in 2014, so okay. about six years. And Are you hearing any issues about the technical stuff, like lead breakage, yeah. batteries going dead real quick? And um, I have not heard any reports of the battery dying prematurely. Um, there are cases where the stimulation lead has become displaced, um, stopped working. Uh, in cases where the sensing lead has broken, um, where the insulation has broken down, um, the um, there was an you know initial um, initial sense lead that was used for two to three years, and then it was replaced about a year and a half ago with a new generation sensing lead, and the new lead is uh, reported to be much more robust and less uh, prone to breakdown. And I think, according to what people from the company tell me, that was kind of the weak link of the device, was that the old sense lead. Yeah, I would think there'd be a lot of action up there. Yeah. Versus, you know, Vegas stimulator comes in kind of low with the neck. Mm-hmm. And kind of much less action up there. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, where the actual lead is sitting is, um, you know, it's essentially in the floor of the mouth. And um, so it's... Um, it's on the hyoglossus muscle and deep to the mylohyoid. Um, so there's not a whole lot of motion at that location, but obviously there's going to be some. Doug? So, you know, in regard to that uh, exposed lead, it's interesting in the silver implant world, uh, and you can actually cover the exposed lead with a vascularized flap. Uh, you get about 80% chance of it recovering. Mm -hmm. If you expose the actual body of the implant, uh, usually what you can have is you can have to keep a flap on, but literally 78% of those will extrude over the extreme glass. Mm -hmm. So we have pretty good luck with the leads, but not actually the body of the implant. And uh, I think the advantage of this is you're putting it under you know, some good thick skin. Yeah. Um, yeah, the IPG device itself is um, under quite a bit of tissue, so I don't think that there's been much trouble with extrusion. There are <clears throat> reports of patients who can't stop playing with it, <laughs> so, so they're always trying to move it around, and I think that there, there's been some problems with that. But I think overall, I mean, we're kind of blessed to operate in the head and neck area, and things, things tend to heal well, so we can get away with uh, things like that exposed wire.